It is Tuesday, October 5th. And here we are one more time inside of our Zoom room. This is where we meet each Tuesday at this time, 8 p.m. Eastern. It's where we have those conversations. It's where we learn and it's where we grow. And today is no different. Each Tuesday, we invite another interesting and exciting guest to come into the room to share with us. And in just a moment, I will be introducing my guest. But before we go any further, I want to welcome you all to the Fireside Chat with Dr. Janice. This is where we build people and change lives. Our sponsor for tonight's program is Purpose Coaching and Training Solutions. Purpose Coaching and Training Solutions is where they expose potential and move you forward. It's a coaching and training solutions company operating from, first, from Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Thank you so much, Purpose Coaching and Training Solutions, for continuing to be our sponsor for each program. Let me bring my guest at this moment to the spotlight before I introduce him. Tonight is going to be one of those programs that you're really going to enjoy. When we hear the word doctor, we think of persons who are really busy persons, but Dr. Channel has taken time out this evening to be with us on the program. And we really want to welcome him. So let me bring him to the spotlight before I introduce him to the audience. Thank you so much. Our guest for tonight is Dr. Goyan Chano. I am sure that those joining us from Jamaica may very well know this name. But for many of us who are joining from other parts of the world, we have persons joining us from Canada, from the Caribbean, perhaps Trinidad and Tobago. We may have persons joining us from the United Kingdom as well. Let me introduce to us our guest for tonight. He's Dr. Guyan Channel. He's a graduate of the University of the West Indies, where he completed his initial medical degree and subsequently his postgraduate degree in ENT. That's a big word, I'm not going to go there. He completed further stupa specialty studies in neurotology, oncology, and skull-based surgery in the, United, in, sorry, in the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Florida, United States. He presently serves as the head of the ENT department at the Kingston Public Hospital and as an associate lecturer examiner in the department of radiology, surgery and intensive care at the University of the West Indies. He has a special interest in hearing and balance disorders and as such, is the founder director of Air, Hearing and Dizzy Center in Kingston, Jamaica. Dr. Channel, we want to welcome you wholeheartedly to the Fireside Conversation. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thanks for having me, Jenny. All right. So let us go into the conversation tonight. Let me ask you first, I just read a little bit of who Dr. Chana is, but I want you to tell us some more. Who exactly is Dr. Chana? You're, you're probably giving a little bit too much there, Jenny. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me simplify it for you. Um, uh, probably some of my Caribbean colleagues will understand this terminology. Dr. Chana is a simple country boy, a simple, simple country boy who came to town and um, in that process, uh, found an area of, of life, of medicine that he fell in love with, uh, ENT. And since then, that has been his passion to continue the progress in ENT. Um, I'm from St. Elizabeth, Jamaica, 
Um, where I'm from is not even on the map, so I don't even bother look for it. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, uh, grew up in St. Elizabeth, high school, Monroe College, and then I went to the University of West Indies. And then, as you mentioned, after that, I had uh, studies in other areas, taking me to the UK and the US. And then I'm, I'm back in Jamaica to give my own contribution here. Thank you so much for that. I, I believe you're repeating my words because I am actually from St. Elizabeth too. And those were the same words I said. My, <laughs> my district is not on the map. <laughs> but yes, it's on the map. Thank you so much for that. So Dr. Chana, tell us, what made you specialize in this area above all the other medical areas that there are? Well, truth be told, I must confess, my initial thought was that I wanted to be an artist when I was growing up. And I remember my, my mom reminding me that artists merely make money after they die, not whilst they're alive. <laughs> and um, that somehow changed my mind. But I must also confess that a major influence was my mom, who is a nurse. And I saw medicine from a very early age, from maybe I was about 11 years old, when persons would come by the house to visit my mom, I would be the one doing the blood pressure from, from that age. And so I was kind of drawn into it, whether or not I, I liked it. But then I, I still I still loved it. And then in ENT, I found an area of medicine that engulfed both science and art, as I would say. ENT in general deals with a lot of function. Um, if you think about it, of the five senses, we deal with three. So we're into a lot of function the function of this, uh, function of hearing, balance, swallowing, speech, smell, taste. It's a, it's a lot of function. But in the surgery itself, you can go from very microscopic surgery where you have, there's a huge difference between a four millimeter space and a 4.5 millimeter space or a 4.25 millimeter space. And you can go major surgery, uh, major in terms of um, broad without the need for microscopes or endoscopes and you can have surgeries of the neck and thyroid surgery etc so it afforded me the luxury of not just focusing on um just surgery but also to think about the functionality of the patient when when all is said and done wow that is really deep the balance and the three areas are connected the ear the nose and the throat Really, really great. But you, you said earlier that you wanted to be an artist. This is so far-fetched because was it was it reggae artists or some no, other no, kind no, no. of artists? Or the <laughs> artists mean, that you paint the picture, that's the one. Yes, I, 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 remember, I remember as clear as day um, what changed my mind. I, I used to get um, nine, nine out of 10 for my, for my artwork when I was in, in school and there was someone who transferred from another school and that person got got nine and a half and i i didn't like it <laughs> and so that kind of changed my mind plus what my mom said and it's true if i you, you not just have to have is that there's a difference between a, a profession and you know an occupation or even an occupation and a job there are certain things that bring the bills in and there are certain things that you have a a, a, a liking for and I'm just blessed that in ENT I found both. I like that. There's a difference between a profession and an occupation. And so you choose the profession. I, well, I chose both because I like it and it brings in the money. <laughs> All right. So, so tell me, doctor, and tell us, how long have you been in the profession? And what have been some of the highlights? Of your, of your profession. I'm sure that there have been many, but talk to us about some of the, the highlights that you have had and how long have you been there? Um, I've been in the profession for almost 15 years and um, there are several things in the profession that I've come to love. I think being here in Jamaica, particularly heading the, the, the department at KPH, but I also work at UWI and Boston. Manti Children's Hospital. You may wonder where do I get so much time. I have no idea. But <laughs> the being at KPH and seeing persons who are genuinely need maybe can't afford service elsewhere, there's always something that tugs at my heart and say, if I can just help that person. You know, there's a there's a story that I heard 
when I was growing up and it stuck with me through everything through throughout my entire um, tenure as ENT where this little boy and I'm taking up a little bit of time but it's important this little boy was there's a there's a huge amount of starfish that was washed up on the shore and he was walking up and every now and then he'd take up one and throw it back in the sea and uh, just take up one and throw back in the sea and he'd walk past him take one and throw back in the sea and somebody watches happening and they ask the boy I mean there are thousands of star there, there are thousands of starfish on the sea why what, what what difference are you making and he took up one and threw it back in the sea he said, I made a difference to that one. Mm -hmm. And so amidst it all, knowing that everything is going on and there are a number of persons who may have challenges health-wise, etc. And there may be some persons who you may not be able to help, but every now and then you come across someone where you made a difference to that one. And that smile and that joy and that gratitude, it just leaves an indelible mark on you. I, I thank you so much for explaining that because... When I think about that, I think about the slogan, building people and changing lives, because that's Absolutely. exactly what you are doing. You're taking Absolutely. the time out to build people. It's not just the money, the profession, it's helping people in a potent way. But um, let me just pause for a moment to say, if you are just coming into the room, tonight we are talking with Dr. Guyan Channel. Dr. Guyan Chana is an ENT specialist. He's also an associate lecturer at the University of the West Indies. You just heard him. He also works at the Kingston Public Hospital and the Bustamante Hospital. And Dr. Chana seemed to have uh, something in him that, that drives him, that pushes him, because I hear him saying that sounds like four different things he's doing at the same time. So my next question to you, Dr. Chana, you're an okay. associate lecturer where you work at these different hospitals. Uh, someone may be wondering what it is that drives you. What is your passion? What allows you to do so much? Well, besides helping the individual, you also get a certain amount of satisfaction from knowing that you can pass on your own knowledge to someone else. Because being an associate yeah. lecturer, then you are able to teach, and you're able to, 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 to years of experience that you've had. Uh, I've always mentioned to the students and the, the medical doctors who I train, I always say to them, look, um, if, if I can't stand on someone else's shoulder, or if I stand on someone else's shoulder, I should be able to see beyond their horizon. It, it can't be that I'm training you and we're going to be seeing at the same level. No. You should be able to stand on my shoulder and be able to see beyond my horizon. The last thing I want to do is to wake up one day in an operating room and open my eyes and see someone who is going to operate on me who could potentially save my life. And at that split second, I wonder if I have taught that individual everything that I know. So the ability to pursue and to carry on knowledge is something that drives me and to get more knowledge just so I can give that back to the certain individuals and they themselves can also give it on to others. This is, this is huge. You said that you, sh you, you can stand on somebody else's shoulder and see the horizon. You, you I, should be able to, if you stand yeah. on someone's shoulder, you should be able to see beyond their horizon. That, that's a hard matter right there. Because many in the profession, I don't think they see things that way. They go out to do a job and they, they come back and it's all about the job. But you are, you're looking deeper than that. You're, you're, you're instilling into others how they should actually live and what they should actually do. Thank you so much for the job that you do, doctor. But I want to talk a little bit about the practical areas of your, your profession. Sure. Because some person may be wondering and asking, why should I see an ENT when I don't have a problem? Or when should I see one then? Should this be something that I do often? Talk to us about that part of it. When should someone visit the ENT? The well, ear, yes. The, the ear, nose, and throat, doctor. Well, <laughs> Sorry. As, you, as you rightly said, you know, what we cover, we cover ear, nose, throat, uh, head and neck issues. So if anyone has any of those issues, then 
a ENT would be a good place to start. You can think about issues with the nose from nosebleeds, um, sinus issues, allergy issues. You can think about issues in the in the neck, like uh, thyroid problems, aka goiter problems, and the throat problems, like the, the, the tons of problems, the speech, hoarseness generally, or even snoring. Many people say, oh, you go to the ENT for snoring? Yeah, you do, because we deal with the earway. So you have to come to us and we assess your snoring and see why you're snoring. Um, but the area that I have come to love beyond all of those, mind you, I still deal with those, but the area I've come to love will be the ear of the ear. And that's because, as you mentioned, I, I did some further studies in neurotology and otology where we, we look at the ear and we look at the nerves from the ear to the brain and we deal with surgeries and diagnosing of all of those areas. So you're talking about hearing loss, you're talking about ringing in the ear, um, colloquially called tinnitus or tinnitus, depending on what side of the Atlantic you're on. You're talking about vertigo or dizziness. And these are areas that we deal with. Now, a lot of persons may not necessarily need to go to the ENT routinely, but certainly if you have issues in these areas, the ENT would be a good place to start. Or if there are other concerns, let's say, for example, you're a smoker and you want to routinely assess to make sure that, you know, there's there's no little cancer starting up in places that you didn't expect, or you have a family history of some, some cancers somewhere, a family history of certain diseases, and you want to have a little screen done for those areas, then certainly the ENT would be the place for you to start where that is concerned. Okay, so thank you so much for that, doctor. But I, I have a question because something troubled me in, in, in the past. When I migrated here to the United States of America, I I actually had to work very close to the sea. And I, I don't want to put a percentage beside it, but I could clearly say 50% of the clients that I see every day had hearing loss. They, they were hard of hearing. And that was, we would call it in Jamaica, hard of hearing. And these were not just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> these, were not, <laughs> these were not just young, um, older persons. These were persons in their 40s, 50s, even 60s, and the older ones were even worse. So is there something like in the air that would cause that kind of condition or how, how does that condition come on to persons for the most part? For the most part, one of the greatest cause of hearing loss is simple wax. You know, persons always say wax, yeah, wax, wax. Wax can really block you up. If you've really had a serious wax infection, you'd realize exactly what I'm talking about. But in the in the younger age group and the children as well, you can have repeated ear infections and fluid in the ear. Um, in swimmers as well, they're more predisposed to having ear infections and fluid in the ear. And I can imagine that that may be one cause of some of those persons, especially in the younger age group, young to middle age age group. Now that I'm getting a little bit um, up in age, I have to be careful what category I call middle age, but in the young to middle age age group, you would have that. But in the older age group, you would have persons who would have a lot of nerve damage or they would have problems with the bones that vibrate in the ear. The common issue for especially the young persons would be that they don't recognize the amount of hearing that you're losing. The analogy I like to use is let's say you're, I'm in Jamaica, so I'll use Jamaica. Um, let's say you're taking a uh, uh, you're taking a drive from one end of the island to the other and you have uh, two opportunities to change out your tires and you drive out hard out of the city and you have to change your tires right away and then you drive hard again and you have to change your tires again pretty soon now before you reach the end of your journey the tires you have left are going to be pretty worn and similarly there are persons who in the early part of their life they would expose themselves to uh, loud music. Um, they'll go on a shooting range and not protect their ears. They'll go to the disco clubs and they would still walk out being able to hear. So as far as they're concerned, it's not affecting them. When in reality, their body has already changed out their tires. Mm. So they may not see the effects then, but in their early 30s and in their 40s, they'll start saying, hang on, why am I losing my hearing? I haven't been around anything that's noisy of late. Why am I losing my hearing? And they, they don't put um, everything together and realize that, you know, it may have been due to me burning my tires 10 years before. So to the young people, it's kind of difficult to tell them that because they walk out to the clubs and they can still hear. And you have to tell them that, look, 
you, you, you got to take it, you got to take it easy because after a while you're going to be paying for all of this. So that, those are some of the reasons why we see uh, persons with hearing loss. Of course, your children were born um, uh, with hearing loss. And where I was in Florida, there, there was a, we worked at the Ear Institute and you would have many children who would come in who would be profoundly deaf from birth. And there, there are many options for them in terms of uh, implants, etc. I've always said uh, hearing is still the only sense that you have that can be restored fully, almost 100% of the time. If you lose your vision, that's it. But if you lose your hearing, um, you can start off with simple things like hearing aids. You can go even further. If the hearing aids don't work, you can put an implant in the ear. And worse, if that implant don't work, you can put an implant in the brain. <laughs> hearing loss still remains the only sensory deficit that can be restored fully. Yes, it is. So that's why I like it because the the returns, um, you know, from this side of the fence, pretty good because at least you can tell a patient, "Look, I can help you," and I'm almost sure that I can help you. Wow. So the the hearing loss is a is a gradual process. It's not it something that that just happens to you overnight most of the time. Well, it can. There, there, there are still a subset of persons who have what we describe as sudden nerve loss or sudden hearing loss. And those are persons who may wake up and the hearing has gone. And it's usually, uh, it's usually associated with a ringing in the ear, this high pitch, as we would call it, to make a cricket sound. Yeah. Part of that, uh, the analogy, not a pure science, but the analogy is like when electrical wires are going bad and it gives off a hum. And that's that's kind of what happens when the nerves go bad. You the patient has a corresponding hum that's associated with it, and those are patients hearing loss or sudden hearing loss is still a medical emergency. If that happens to you, then you should turn up at your ENT within the first two weeks, and in eighty percent of the time it can be restored fully, but it has to be identified. Most of the time, hearing loss is gradual, but in the cases where it happens suddenly. You got to treat it as an emergency and turn up at your ENT. I'm curious, doctor, because back in Jamaica, we hear this term so often, my, my ear's ringing. <laughs> I mean, we grew Somebody up Somebody calling that. my name. Somebody <laughs> calling my name, yes. <laughs> so, so does that mean that we should be turning up at the ENT when, so, when we hear, feel that ringing in our ears? Well, ringing in, our, ringing in your ear, especially if it's on one side, if it's unilateral, it's always a cause for concern. If their ringing is on both sides, then on average, it's usually due to uh, symmetrical age-related hearing loss. But if the ringing is on one side, then we have to ask ourselves the question, is there something on one side of the brain, something on one ear that's causing the problem? We have to rule out various things like tumors. We have to rule out various other things that could be just affecting one ear. A unilateral ringing in your ear, one side of ringing in your ear, has to be investigated. Now, I've mentioned the commonest one where you hear that loud hum, but other types of noise in your ear can be where you have like a beating sound in your ear, um, almost like you hear in your heartbeat. And um, that's another one that can indicate that it's more than just a nerve problem, and that should also be investigated. Wow. No, no. <laughs> This is this is sounding a little serious because um, <laughs> I, I'm sure most persons hear that that humming and that noise in their ears at different times. So I'm coming to my next question for you. But if you are just joining the room, I want you to invite someone else in, send them a message, send them a text, tell them to come into this room because we are talking with Dr. Guyan Chana, and this is something that we all need to hear. We are talking about the power of the air. And this is a topic that is uh, critical and crucial, especially at this time. Um, and Dr. Chana, when I say especially at this time, because last year, I believe that I was one of the persons who had a COVID, but my air was, was what started to, to, to pain me first before yeah. I before I, I, I actually got sick. So the, uh, the question I want to ask you, doctor, sure. should, should someone go to the ENT 
for regular checkup. You know, we go to the doctor once or twice a year. We say we go for our, our regular checkup. Should we come, even if we don't hear that humming, even if we don't have any pain, even if nothing, should we include the ENT um, for regular checkups as well? Well, especially if you have risk factors. If you have risk factors for certain things, then it should be a part of your regular schedule. Let's say you work in a noisy environment. Let's say you work in somewhere that you are ex you're exposed to noise and you're at risk for hearing loss. Let's say you work in a very dusty environment and as a result, you're, you're prone to sinus related issues. And if you're prone to developing polyps or anything of that nature in your nose, let's say you've been smoking in the past and you have uh, risk factors for cancers, et cetera, et cetera, or you use a voice a lot and um you 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 worry about uh having things coming up on your voice box that you, you've never planned for you know even even other things that may seem as as if it's out of the range of ent like having acid reflux disease for example those are things that you may want to check out because some things that are a little bit mundane you can still have issues from it um if you have a little lump on your neck and you you, you want to check it out but just to get up and say, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to go to the ENT and fit well and healthy. Uh, it's always good to have a check, but you'll have more benefit if you're in any of those categories that I just mentioned. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. So now we know um, that at least we should be checking up on our air if we depending on where we work depending on where we live to what you're exposed we, to yeah exactly so we should be doing those regular checkups uh maybe yeah. once a year twice a year doctor uh once or twice a year i mean there's some persons who come in for for wax cleaning once or twice a year i i know in recent times especially in the, in the covid season now everyone is checking out what's going on in the nose <laughs> and, uh, and and that's fine too because you you want to be sure that nothing else is going on in there uh, some person may come to me after they say man i had to go have a covid swab and that swab could not pass i wonder why my nostril is so blocked <laughs> and then we have to have a look and see and you may realize that they have some underlying allergy sinus issues that leads to congestion so even then um, in the present COVID period, you want to make sure that your nasal cavity is, is really optimized. You know, you, if you're prone to having sniffles and stuff like that, then that's a nice little base for the virus to just sit and multiply and have its way with you. You want to make sure that your nostrils are clear, optimized. There's nothing there that's going to predispose you or make you more likely to have an infection or even COVID. So, uh, I think in this day and age, it's, 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 it's not a bad option. It's not a bad option at all. But, but doctor, one of the things that growing up, my, my mother used to tell us too, because back then we used to take the feather from, oh the, from, the, from the hens, from <laughs> the chicken, and we used to take it off and we used to put it in our ears. And they used to say, don't put anything in your ear. Don't take out the wax. Don't put anything in your ear. So. <laughs> That was not the right thing then. No, your, your ear cleans itself. Your ear is almost like funnel shaped where it's, it's bigger on the outside and then gets narrow. So when you put Q-tip in there or something and you touch the wax right here, everything else that's down here, you're packing it back like sand in a barrel. I like to teach with analogies and it gets the point across. I was asked my patient, let's say there's a muddy puddle outside. And you should go outside and you should step in it and then you walk wipe your shoes off on the grass have you cleaned up the puddle no but your shoe got dirty so the q-tip gets dirty but it doesn't clean not because you see the q-tip coming out with wax on it means that it has done anything at all and as a matter of fact there's so much danger from q-tips i've seen persons come in with a q-tip bud left in the air i've seen infection long-lasting infection chronic q-tip use results in minor scarring of your ear canal and some canals actually start to get smaller and they say okay maybe it's wax i need to push the q-tip in more i've seen eardrums being ruptured i've seen um the bones of your ear being totally displaced by q-tips as i tell my medical students i say look 
What if I can say this on air? But I say Q-tips are from the devil. <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't put Q-tips in your ear. And if most persons who argue about Q-tip use are going to be real and true with themselves, they use it because it feels good, not because it cleans. <laughs> that, that's the reality. Wow. Yes. But when you think about it, the, the Q-tip is actually pushing whatever was there down further. But it yes. does come out looking as if it, it, it has done some work. But it has done nothing. It's, it simply got dirty, just like your shoe. Wow. Doctor, I, I, I'm just listening to you and I, I, I can sense that you love your work so much. What part of the, your work give you the most satisfaction? Hands down, I would have to say the ability to let someone hear again. And I'll give you examples um, from simple things, as you mentioned, that can block up your ear from wax, from fluid, from um, ruptured eardrum, um, dislocated bones in the ear, all of these things. I think that I think the loudest outside of church, I think the loudest praise the Lord I've ever heard in my life is when I cleaned someone's ear and they, and they were so grateful. <laughs> that, was, that was the loudest I've ever heard. Um, I, I remember there's a patient who had uh, a fixed bone in the ear and we replaced that, otosclerosis it's called, or stapes surgery. We replaced that and the joy that she had from being able to give away her hearing aid to somebody else and um the joy that i've seen i remember when 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 i was working in florida we'd be putting in implants for children who were they were born profoundly deaf and there is hardly any greater joy than when the child comes back and you turn on that machine for the first time and the child does this wondering what's that they're hearing Ooh. and and that that moment is something that's hard to duplicate when you restore hearing to someone because hearing is hearing is greatly underappreciated in it um let me take some time and just mention this yeah, I, I've done I've done a little bit of stuff when I teach medical students. I, I do like a straw poll and I ask, okay, if you could lose one sense, which one would you give up? And invariably, I think smelling and hearing comes on the list. But hearing is so important for communication. Even right here, we're having this discussion, despite the fact that you can see my image. Communication is key for safety. Most of the alarms that we have are the ways of guiding us away from danger are auditory. Mind you, you may see a, a, a ambulance uh, flashing lights or a police flashing light, but almost all our alarms, our car alarm, our phone alarm. Um, if there, uh, and, and I say this because there's a friend of mine who's profoundly deaf and they were having a fire drill. And it's only when the persons came back in the building that she realized that there was a fire drill because she didn't hear it. And you think about the simple things, you often hear a truck horn or a car horn before you see it. So safety is something that um, the, the, the communication helps to restore. Many of us may have a friend who is blind and we still hang out because you can call them. You know, you can talk to them. You can call them and say, hey, what's up? But how many of us have a deaf friend? You know, the ability to form relationships hangs heavily on communication, verbal communication. And the ability to disseminate information hangs heavily on verbal communication. Um, we may not have a deaf friend, and they, the deaf community tends to stick together because they don't, they're not able to communicate with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And as a result, even, 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 even um, professions, even companies would be willing to hire someone who's blind. A lot of telephone operators, I found out that a lot of telephone operators I know are actually blind because, you know, you're just hearing their voice. But how many job opportunities are there for deaf people and that's partly why i have a little passion for it you know someone can't talk can't communicate there's hardly a place for them in the works in the work field so i take a lot of joy from hearing restoration it brings back a new dimension to an individual it unites families and it brings people together 
Doctor, I thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm hearing the passion in you and what you do. And I noticed that some persons have come into the room since we last spoke. If you have come in since we started and since we last spoke, we're talking with Dr. Guyan Chano. He is uh, so much, but let me just say he is an ENT um, doctor. He is a lecturer. He works at three of the major hospitals in Kingston, Jamaica, and he is here on the Fireside program with us tonight. And I'm sure many of you have questions for Dr. Channel. You have concerns, you have comments. And in just another, say, three to five minutes, I will leave enough time so that you can ask your questions and you can make your comments and you can just talk to Dr. Dr. Channel. Um, but Dr. Chana, uh, I know that you are somewhere in Kingston yes. and we have a huge population across the United States here, persons may be hearing, and I mean, huge Jamaican population across the United States here, particularly in my area. And we have persons here joining from Canada as well. And they might be hearing and say, you know, I need to send my mother, I need to send my sister, I need to send somebody to go and do a checkup because I didn't know that this was something that they needed to do at least once a year. How can persons connect with you? Where is your office? Where can they make an appointment to see Dr. Chana? Or where, who can you send them to? How can Dr. Chana be reached? All right, well, my, my office is, um, my office is presently at Winchester Business Center, and that's uh, 15 Hope Road, in Kingston. That's near to Halfway Tree. And my telephone number is the best way to get an appointment will be 876-633-0108, or there's a cell attached as well, 876-322-2850, And sometimes with a cell, particularly persons from overseas uh, would probably send a WhatsApp to the to this to the um to the cell, but they can also send an email at uh, Dr. Channer D R C H A N N E R dot as in a period E N T as in a profession office E N T office at gmail dot com, and that that can help significantly. What I can do for you, Janice, I can probably just put some of that in the chat. Thank and you that, so much for that, Doctor. I appreciate that, that so be, that persons can helpful. get it. Thank you so much. I'm going to be opening the floor in just a moment, but I see quite a few comments and questions in the chat. If you have a question or a comment for Dr. Channel, please go ahead and place it in the chat before I open the floor for you to ask all your questions. But Dr. Channel, I am seeing here... Uh, let me see what questions we have here. Someone says the smallest thing that you should put in your ear is, a, is your elbow. I know that person is joking around. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much for that. Question for Dr. Channa. Give us some, give us some tips for ear, nose, and throat care during COVID. Yes. All right. So that's a question that's been asked, you know, quite often of late. Some of the tips I had mentioned some before, trying to keep your nostril and your throat um, pretty nice, pretty clear, so that oh. there's no nice environment for the virus to lodge on. The thought is that the virus, when it enters, it normally would multiply in either the mouth or the nose before it gets into the blood and before it gets to the lungs and before all of that, which is why the swab is predominantly done from the nose. There's some places where they do it in the throat as well, but predominantly from the nose. So anything at all that will aid in getting the virus washed away quickly enough will reduce the chances of the virus actually multiplying. So you can think about it. You can think about simple things like uh, saline nose drops, um, steam inhalation, menthol crystals, um, anything that kind of helps to flush out the nostril a little bit. Even, uh, I know, I don't want to use any trade names, but we know all know the various types of saline irrigation that's out there. And um, keeping your 
your oral cavity, your mouth as well, the same way, always kept in a manner that, you know, the virus will want to come in there and just die. <laughs> it will not find a nice environment to survive. But there are other things as well. So keeping those areas clean, keeping those areas healthy. Of course, you know, the dietary stuff, you have to maintain a proper balanced immune system. And that goes without saying. There are many ways of doing that. There, there we, we know what we would mix up and blend up in Jamaica, right, Janice? But many That's right. <laughs> um, other places have other things based on the kind of food products that they have. So these are some of the ways that you can prepare um, in Corona time because we're, you know, wearing masks, etc. The ability of the nostril to clear itself is reduced at times. I'm not saying that is detrimental, but it's reduced at times. So if you can go on mass breaks, I've seen persons driving around in their car by themselves with a mask on. Yeah. <laughs> You know, give your nostrils some freedom to breathe, to exhale, to there may be some viral particles in there. You need to get out before it starts multiplying. So a mass break and, 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 and give yourself a chance to recover. So those are the main things that I would recommend from an ENT standpoint that could help in this present climate. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Chenna. Someone is asking how important are the tonsils? The tonsils, the tonsils are important, particularly in the first two, three years of life. What a tonsil, the role of the tonsil is to identify the bacteria entering the body. If that bacteria is one that the body needs to fight, then the tonsil will respond to that bacteria, but not just respond, but it will tell the rest of the body how to respond to it. It will tell the rest of the body how to kill it. So setting that platform after a certain age, after a child reaches five, six, seven, eight, the role of the tonsil therefore will diminish. In other words, do you absolutely need it? Not necessarily, because by that time, the rest of the body is now fully aware of how to fight that infection. So that is why if you take out the tonsils at that time, it doesn't cause the child to be more predisposed to any illnesses. It doesn't, because by that time, the rest of the body is trained. And so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. So the tonsil is more so for when you're young. You need to take it. It's more care important, of, yes. More important when you're young. Uh, someone is asking, doctor, if I snore, what do I need to do to cure it? <laughs> <laughs> ah, boy. I give so many lectures and snoring each year. So... Let's set the concept. Normally we breathe through our nose. I'm sorry, I use a lot of analogies as you realize because I teach a lot. So <laughs> Normally you breathe through your nostril. If your body recognizes you're not getting enough air in through your nose, it will tell you to breathe through your mouth. And you open your mouth and air goes in and out. Now your mouth is designed so that any air coming out of it will produce a sound, which is why your belch is so loud. Any ear coming out of your mouth, your mouth is designed for sound production. So similarly, if you're, a, if, if you're breathing heavily through your mouth, especially when you're asleep, you are going to snore. The role of the ENT, snoring is just a loud noise, it's just a loud sound. The role of the ENT is to identify the areas that the obstruction is present so we know why your brain is telling you to breathe through your mouth. So we would put an endoscope up your nostril, looking at the front, looking at the back, looking at the back of the throat, looking at the back of the tongue, all the way down to your voice box and your windpipe, your trachea, in order to identify the areas of obstruction. It's not just your tonsil alone. It can be the back of your tongue as it gets enlarged in patients with acid reflux. Once you've identified those areas, then we determine, is this an area that can be restored by medication or this is an area that has to be restored otherwise. But before we even jump to the otherwise, the S word, the word no one wants to hear, the surgery, we have to also identify what are the functional issues. So let's say, for example, once I get an analogy, I said I teach by analogies, so that's, that's the way I get things across. If you're asked to take a, to drive a truck of water to the top of Mount Everest, and something happened to the tank, and you're only able to transport half tank, you have to make two trips. Now let's put it in perspective. If during the night, your lungs only 
gets half the required oxygen, your heart has to work twice as hard to get the same amount of oxygen around the body. So that is why hypertension is actually one of the commonest causes or commonest result of sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a, is the, is a condition where you don't get enough sleep at night and you don't get enough oxygen. And there are many patients, actually there are a few patients who after you correct their sleep apnea and their snoring, they come off the hypertensive meds because all along the heart was just overworking to meet the need of oxygen. And other things can happen as well. As you'd imagine, you know, your body recovers at night. So if you don't get a chance to sleep and recover, the end result is that you're gonna not be able to do appropriate repairs. So I've seen patients with hypertension, I've seen patients who go as far as to have uh, psychiatric issues, patients who go as far as to have even seizures as a result of sleep apnea, which is identified by snoring. So snoring is just not just a loud noise. As I always tell my patients, <laughs> if, I, if I see a gentleman come in the office and he comes in with um, his, his, his spouse or his consort, nine out of 10 times is because he snores. The ladies always push the men through the door <laughs> and say, you gotta go check this out. But I always say to them, let's check it out because we need to know if it's a medical issue and we have to treat the patient or it's a social issue and we have to give the consort some earplugs. The end result, however, must be the restoration of oxygen. Now, bearing in mind that it can happen at different levels. That's why no one shot fits all. I've seen persons who they advertise that they have these nice little nose things that you can put on your nose and it will stop your snoring. But guess what? If the reason for your obstruction is the back of your tongue, you could put on 10 nose strips. <laughs> it will not make a difference. <laughs> so you have to first identify the cause before you apply a treatment. There's no one shot fits all. Wow. Doctor is giving us so much information tonight. This is this is really potent because some of these things we we just didn't know before. You talk about the sleep, and I'm waking up at three o'clock every morning. And sometimes I can't go back to sleep. That's bad. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> it's not good. And don't don't apologize for the analogy because I I used to be a lecturer myself. I used to lecture at NCU and I use I know how it is. We always are using the analogy to bring points out. So don't, don't apologize for the analogy. I do understand. <laughs> but someone else has another question, and I'm so happy that you're giving us um these these real great examples and answering these questions for us because we're learning so much from this tonight i see another question someone says what is the cause of tinnitus tinnitus yep. and what's the best way to deal with it uh tinnitus uh is a terminology used for an abnormal noise in the ear most times it's only heard by the individual there are some times where you can actually hear the sound from someone else's ear, but that's usually the exception rather than the rule. Now, most times it also coincides with hearing loss, most times, not all the time. As I mentioned before, certainly if you have it on one side, it's a growing cause for concern, but as your hearing nerve weaken, for whatever reason, from age-related or trauma or whatever else it may be, the response is that you will hear an abnormal high pitch monotone like almost when for those who can appreciate this and um, without telling our ages janice we both can appreciate the days when tv used to sign off that's right <laughs> so <laughs> that 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 high pitch monotone me that 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 can drive people crazy if it's unilateral, if it's one-sided, it oftentimes requires an investigation. If tinnitus is identified and treated within the first two to four weeks, it can often be resolved and restored. If we can identify an appropriate cause of tinnitus in patients who don't have nerve loss, let's say, for example, I've seen patients with so much wax in their ear that they hear that ringing sound. And they say, why should it ring there for? Well, ask yourself the question, when you put a seashell to your ear, don't you hear that little mm -hmm. Sometimes just an occlusion of the ear canal 
can result in that sound. So first things first, you need to have someone look in your ear. You need to identify if there's anything obvious that can be removed or corrected. If there's nothing that can be removed or corrected, then you gotta have a hearing test done to see if there's hearing loss that you not yet that you can't identify. Oftentimes the mistake is that we use speech to assess if we can hear properly. Our hearing range is like this. Speech, we only utilize speech for this range. So if we were to use speech alone, we can't tell if we can hear properly here or here. So sometimes you have to do an objective hearing test and you may have to do a brain scan as well to assess for those. This is so much that we're getting here tonight. And we have about seven, eight minutes left before the program is um, supposed <laughs> to end. But it has been such a night for us tonight. Thank you so much, doctor, for coming in here. It's, it's as if you're up at the university giving us a lecture right now that we are not paying for. <laughs> <laughs> and we do thank you so much. But I see another question in the chat. And if you have any more questions, drop them fast because we are almost up on time. Can old age hearing loss be corrected? Um, old age hearing loss, I guess, one would be referring to nerve damage, um, which is the commonest cause of old age hearing loss. I say commonest because there was a there there are some patients who may have stiffening of the bones of the ear. When the sound hits the ear, the bones vibrate and conduct that to the nerve. And if those bones can't vibrate, then it can't conduct to the nerve. And so replacing those bones, I the, the oldest patient I did do that was um, 82 years old. And replacing those bones restored the hearing. But if you're talking about age-related hearing loss, now it's usually nerve-related. Now corrected, one has to ask the question, uh, what do you mean by correction? Because let's say, for example, I have a visual problem. I have, I have, I have an eyesight problem. I correct it with my glasses. So, but sometimes when persons ask correction, they, they're thinking about correction without any appliances whatsoever. So I have to clarify that. So old age hearing can be corrected with hearing aids. Let's, let's start from the basic. And, um, and there's some fancy hearing aids right now. I mean, <laughs> once again, to use another, I, I have all these stories. Uh, a little gentleman um, has bilateral hearing aids, hearing aids in both ears. And when he's trying to watch a TV and his wife comes and starts talking on this side, he reaches into his pocket because he has a remote control and he turns off this one. <laughs> and listens to the TV or the other one. So hearing aids are so fancy now. Hearing aid technology is linked to cell phone technology. So ask yourself the question, how far has cell phone technology come in the past 10 years? Mm. There are so many things. Hearing aids can be linked to Bluetooth. It can be linked to your radio. It can be linked to your car. It can be linked to a remote control. You can turn it up and down from your computer, from your phone, many different things. Now, if you go further, as I said, you can actually put implants in. You can put implants in someone who has lost hearing, you can do that implant. I think the oldest person I implanted was 104 years old. And said, man, you implant somebody 104 years old, but guess what? The man was fit and fine, everything else. The only problem he had is hearing loss. Why deprive him, you know? And he lived the thing for another five years, five years worth of hearing. So you can put implants in that can correct that. So there are many options, but if hearing loss occurs suddenly, we can correct that just with medication. So depending on the timing and the cause of the hearing loss. Wow. Doctor, there are so many questions coming and I'm just going to open the floor for the last five to seven minutes that, that's left <laughs> so that uh, <laughs> any other person that is left can ask their questions. So I'm going to just go ahead and change the view for a moment.